I'm Peter Nash. This week I was asked a really important question, and that is, how do you account for derivatives? These are really important because trading desks buy or sell derivatives to take on risk or to mitigate existing risk. So as finance professionals, there's a good reason why we need to know how to account for them. So in order to know how to account for derivatives, the first thing that you need to know is what's a derivative. Now today we're going to be looking at IFRS and how they define and account for derivatives. IFRS or International Financial Reporting Standards are issued by the International Accounting Standards Board and they've been adopted by over 100 countries. So what is a derivative? Well, there's three attributes an instrument has to have to be defined as a derivative. Firstly, a derivative's value needs to change with respect to one or more underlying variables. So that could be a price, so like a stock or a bond price, an interest rate, like SOFA, BBSW, LIBOR, SONIA, a commodity price or an FX rate. Let's have a look at the most common types of derivatives, swaps, options, futures, and forwards. So with a swap, all it is is you're exchanging the return on one thing for another. For example, an interest rate swap with a notional of $10 million, where it's going to pay a fixed coupon rate of 3%, and you're going to receive the floating SOFA rate. SOFA just stands for the Secured Overnight Financing Rate, and it's a US interest rate index. So in this case, the underlying variable is SOFA. Now, when it comes to options, options are the right, but not the obligation to buy or sell an underlying at a predetermined price. I'm a huge fan of Tesla. So if we use Tesla as an example, buy a Tesla call option, and the nominal or the notional is 100 stocks, at a predetermined price of $300. That's expiring in one month's time. So for this right to buy Tesla at this price, we're going to pay a premium of $2,000. Now, the underlying variable in this case is the Tesla stock price. Now, when it comes to futures and forwards, we'll look at futures first. So futures is where you're buying and selling an underlying at a future date at a predetermined price. And these are traded on an exchange with a central counterparty. So for instance, oil's a, a big topic at the moment with the war in Ukraine. So we're going to buy 1,000 barrels of oil on the crude oil, sorry, 1,000 barrels of crude oil on the CME at a price of $90. And this contract settles in December. So in this case, the underlying variable is the crude oil price. And forwards are the same. The only difference between a forward and a future is that forwards are settled on a bilateral basis between two counterparties in the over-the-counter market. They're not traded on an exchange. So we've covered the first attribute. The second attribute is that the net initial investment of the derivative is either zero, so nothing, or it's smaller than another instrument which would have a similar response to the underlying variable. So let's go through the previous contracts we've looked at. So we looked at a swap. So with a swap, there's no net initial investment. And if we want to get a, another instrument which had a similar response to SOFA, let's say a loan or a bond, we'd have to actually pay $10 million, get exposure, the same exposure, similar exposure to that interest rate index. Now, when it comes to options, so options, you pay or receive a premium upfront. Now, in the example that we use, the Tesla call option, if we wanted to look at an instrument which had a similar response to the underlying stock price, we'd go out and buy 100 Tesla stocks, 100 Tesla shares to get a similar response to the un underlying variable. Now, if we did that, it's going to cost us about $30,000. Now, a point to note here is that with options, if you have a deep in the money option, so that means if Tesla is trading at $300 at the moment. If you've got a call option with a strike price at $200, say, that's deep in the money. And deep in the money options usually act more like a position in the underlying stock itself. So when you have deep in the money options, it may be difficult to justify reporting them as derivatives. Now for futures, there's no net initial investment. With the accounting center, we don't have to consider any security. 
or any collateral that we've paid in order to trade on the exchange, like initial margin. So if we look at another instrument which has a similar response to the futures contract of a thousand barrels of oil, if we went out and bought 1,000 barrels of oil, that would cost us around about $90,000 in today's terms. So the futures contract has a smaller net initial investment to that instrument, which would have a similar response to the underlying crude oil price. Now for forwards, it's the same thing. There's no net initial investment. Brings us to the third and final attribute. So the third and final attribute to classify something as a derivative is that it has to settle at a future date. It can't have already settled. So now that we know what a derivative is, let's look at the way that we account for these derivatives. So the default classification measurement for derivatives is fair value through the income statement. So from a balance sheet perspective, if the fair value of your derivative is greater than zero, you're going to be reporting that as an asset. If the fair value is less than zero, you're going to be reporting it as a liability. So in this slide, I've presented assets or derivatives with uh, a fair value of greater than zero as, as derivative assets, and with a fair value of less than zero as derivative liabilities. So for derivative assets, we debit the balance sheet, and for derivative liabilities, we credit the balance sheet. Now, when your fair value changes, so let's say it starts off at zero, it goes up to 100, or if it goes from 100 up to $200, we want to report those changes through the income statement in a non-interest non -interest revenue line. So if we have a gain, so the fair value has gone up in value, we want to credit the income statement and debit the balance sheet. And if the fair value has gone down, we're going to credit the balance sheet and debit the income statement. Looking at an example uh, from the swaps and forwards, let's assume that our fair value of our swap is $100 in our favor. We would debit our balance sheet into derivative assets and we'd credit, say, other operating income in our income statement. If our forward has a negative MPV or fair value of $100, we would go and debit our income statement and we'd credit our balance sheet into derivative liabilities. Now, when it comes to the market, uh, different companies present their financial statements with different line items. I'm originally from Australia. So if you look at the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, which is Australia's biggest bank, you'll see that in their income statement, they report gains and losses due to derivatives trading into the trading income line in their income statement. If you look at their balance sheet, they report their derivatives with a fair value of greater than zero as derivative assets and fair values of less than zero as derivative liabilities. Let's head stateside now to Citi's financial results. And Citi report their derivatives, gains and losses into a line item called principal transactions in the income statement. When it comes to the balance sheet, Citi report their derivative assets as trading account assets and their derivative liabilities as trading account liabilities. So they're presenting their results differently to the previous example we saw. That brings us to the end of derivative accounting. There's so much more to learn as finance professionals about financial accounting and reporting, right through from recognition and derecognition classification and measurement, fair value, netting, and hedge accounting. If you would like to learn more, head over to finset.com and inquire about the courses I can provide to either you as an individual or to your company.